without further ado, uh, Dr. Nagin Sobani um, will be presenting uh, this topic. She's a third year resident. Does percutaneous biopsy cause metastasis? Okay, hi everyone. You all know me by now. <laughs> um, so I'm one of the third year medical residents. We'll talk about what, what Dr. Freed just mentioned during this few minutes. Uh, I wanted to start off with an outline of what we'll talk about today. We'll cover some traditional biopsy techniques at first and then uh, go on to overview of numerous case reports that have been published in this topic, then talk about a few systemic review and meta-analysis studies, and then at last we'll go over some uh, alternate biopsy techniques. So let's start off with our traditional biopsy um, techniques. This is fine needle aspiration, and in this case I use thyroid as an example. And as you see traditionally what's been done is you use some um, anesthetics such as lidocaine to numb up the tissue, and you use a 23 to a 27 ga gauge needle to uh, aspirate the content, and then aspirate is usually sent for studies like pathology, cytology, and micro. So it's pretty simple and self-explanatory and it's uh, on this, depicted on the picture as well. Moving on to core needle biopsies, um, as you see here, the type of needle that's used has a trough in the middle and it has an outer uh, cutting cannula as well, usually it's spring-loaded. The needle is inserted into the mass normally and then the outer sheath is fired. Subsequently, the needle is withdrawn and then the, you have the biopsy of the tissue that you need right here in the middle of the trough and then you send that for further study. So. Let's go over some of the case reports that have been published. Most of the literature that I found uh, about seeding after percutaneous biopsy is all case reports. There's numerous case reports about sarcomas, various different GI tract tumors, renal cell carcinoma, transitional cell carcinoma, prostate, lung, breast, you name it, that have been published. But you may wonder what is one of the first cases that have been reported. We've been doing percutaneous needle biopsies since 1883, but it was difficult for me to find any literature from back then. The earliest um, case report that I found reporting seeding after percutaneous needle biopsy was published in JAMA on May 1st, 1954. And it's a case of a patient who developed subcutaneous tumor three months after percutaneous needle biopsy that ended up diagnosing him with lung adenocarcinoma. The subsequent second case report was published in 1969 in the Annals of Internal Medicine, reporting similar findings with seeding after biopsy of a patient that ended up having lung adenocarcinoma. And then ever since then, there's just been numerous, numerous case reports. I'm just giving you a few examples here just to illustrate that. Uh, for instance, there are the transitional cell seeding, then you have the pancreatic cancer seeding, uh, lung tumor seeding, as well as the bile duct. So we're not going to go into the details of these various case reports, but you get the idea. Let's talk about systematic review and meta-analysis studies that have been done in this topic. The first article we're going to talk about is needle tract se seeding after percutaneous biopsy of sarcomas. Dr. Berger here um, actually did um, pulled three different studies together. The first three are here that I want you to look at, uh, Dr. Mahana, Ribeiro, and Oliveira. There was a total of 63 patients in this pulled study that they all underwent excision of the needle tract with primary surgical resection of their sarcoma, and this is lower extremity sarcoma. And in those patients, they found that um, eight out of the 63, or 13% of them, harbored microscopic deposits of sarcoma within that needle tract. The second part of this study was pooling of a second, uh, two, two other studies, Dr. Kaffenberger and Dr. Sakir's studies, which ended up actually having only 30 patients as, as depicted here, but these patients underwent primary resection of their sarcoma, but didn't have any excision of, their, of that needle tract at all. And then they were subsequently uh, reported to have 
uh, no seeding occurrence or clinical disease recurrence up to four years. They were followed up to four years. They, there was various imaging studies as well as physical exam that was done to see if there was any seeding occurring um, or a recurrence of disease and they were, they were none reported. So at the end, the authors concluded that the incidence of extremity sarcoma um, seeding is only about 13%, and they said the prognostic impact of that is very minimal. So that was this study. The second part of the same study looked at retroperitoneal sarcomas. And in this study, they looked at institutional um, places and they, they looked at various institutions in London, Sydney, Milan, as well as Toronto. They ended up with 547 patients. And uh, what they concluded, and all of these patients actually received percutaneous cor core needle biopsy of their retroperitoneal mass, ended up being sarcomas, and only two out of the 547 uh, were presumed to have needle tract seeding. So that's a 0.37% um, reportedly. So the authors concluded in this case that retroperitoneal masses um, are safe to biopsy. Next study we want to talk about was published in the World Journal of Surgery in 2010, which uh, is actually reviewing thyroid needle biopsies. In this case, uh, we had uh, a total of 19 different patients um, found in the retros retrospective observational studies. And the authors concluded, as noted here, that none of these patients or the incidence of tr tracking seating um, in their um, needles, needle track was so minimal that it was less than 1%. So they concluded that thyroid biopsies also lead to very low incidence of needle track seating. The next article was published in the Hepatology Journal in 2008 by Dr. Silva, and it looked at needle tract seeding following biopsy of liver lesions to diagnose hepatocellular carcinoma. And in this study, there was a total of 1,340 patients enrolled. They ended up finding out that the percentage of seeding per year was only 0.9%, and in none of the reported cases of these seedings, the did the event ever impact the patient's survival? And the lesions usually were successfully treated by resection or by local ablation. So they concluded that, again, there's no prognostic impact from the needle tract seeding, although it does occur. Looking at a different organ system, looking at the prostate, this study was published in the BJUI um, journal and they looked at 26 different publications with a total of 42 patients that ended up having seeding after prostate cancer biopsy. And they noted that less than 1% of the population that they looked at ended up having incident of needle tract seeding. And again, saying that it is safe to um, perform a prostate biopsy. So, you may wonder, what are some other ways to biopsy um, masses? So there is this sort of a newer technique called coaxial biopsy, uh, in which I don't know how well you can see this, but you have a needle entering the suspected tumor, and then the first needle is withdrawn, as you see, but there's a metal sheath left behind. And this uh, metal sheath stays in here. You insert the biopsy needle, which is about an 18 gauge needle, and then you uh, take the biopsy that you need and retract, retract the tissue that you need. But as you remove the specimen, you notice that uh, there's complete protection without, without that biopsied tumor or cancer ever touching any healthy tissue surrounding it. And the angle of that sheath can be altered such that you can have multiple biopsies uh, of that same site without uh, puncturing that, that capsule of the tumor again. So you may wonder, does this work? Does this change anything? There was a study done in, that was published in a radiology journal that looked at uh, tumor seeding in hepatocellular carcinoma after percutaneous needle biopsy using this very technique. Uh, it was actually published in 2006, so it's not that new. The study uh, looked at a thousand different 
liver masses. And after they biopsy them, 128 of them end up having hepatocellular carcinoma. They follow these patients for up to 30 days to look for any sites of seeding, uh, any recurrence of the disease or subcutaneous seeding and such. And they found out, they concluded that there was zero incidence of needle tract seeding after this, this method that was used. So their recommendation was to use this, this biopsy technique. And they think that the reason why this worked is because the needle introducer that remains in that position, um, it prevents and protects the normal tissue surrounding the, um, that's on the way you know, out from the, from the tract. And that's why they think this prevented seeding. What do we do here at Cottage? We use the COYAC axial needle technique for our biopsies, so. <laughs> We got it going on. And so just to summarize everything we talked about, most of the literature we talked about and is out there is just on case reports. But these few important meta-analysis studies that we talked about showed overall very, very low incidence of uh, needle track um, seeding. And most of them agreed that there is no prognostic impact, even if there was seeding. So Dr. Berger's. Uh, study in 2017 showed a 13% incident of seeding with extremity sarcomas, and there was no prognostic impact. And then that retroperitoneal masses are safe to biopsies, do biopsy. And for thyroid biopsies, there was less than 1% incident of needle tract seeding. In 2008, there was no prognostic impact of those patients that did end up getting seeding after liver biopsies. In 2015, there was a less than 1% um, incidence of needle tract seeding in prostate biopsies. And then at last, I showed you guys the coaxial cutting needle technique that showed zero incidence of seeding. So these are the references. Question? Yes. What about the biopsies? So I didn't, I, all I found was multiple, multiple case reports. I didn't find, um, good enough of a meta-analysis study that I wanted to present. Um, so that's why I didn't put it in there. But it is definitely, there's many case reports saying that it does occur. Although, I'm speaking for myself, mm -hmm. and I'm probably Jeff and my colleagues, I, I've never seen one that I know of myself. I mean, yeah. that would be, it doesn't happen. I mean, interestingly, it's pretty infrequent. Right. Interestingly, the very first case report of this at all, the first two are about lung biopsies seeding. So um, it does occur, but it occurs very rarely. So I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, um, do you know if they ever came across, like, whether or not, like, how well differentiated the tumor was affected? Yes, they did. So there was a couple of studies. Again, I didn't think that they, we had enough time to go over everything. But one of the studies I read, they looked at uh, differentiation as well. And they noted that studies that were, uh, or tumors that were less differentiated, they ended up seeding more frequently. OK, so. Um, so this is, it was a little bit difficult when we were talking, when Nagin and I were talking about this, how to, how to present this, because clearly there, there is, there are a lot of reports of seeding of s small numbers of cancer cells, but it's very infrequent, if not rare, and obviously it, as she presented, depends on the, the needle type as well as possibly the tumor type. Um, but the real question, and I think the real fear that patients have, physicians and, you know, anybody has, is it really going to spread the tumor and, and worsen my prognosis if this is done? And I think that the, generally the data has shown that it doesn't really affect prognosis. Now, that may be because these tumors are all resected. It may be because, you know, if you have a positive, you know, a malignant tumor, on a biopsy, you generally take it out. And you know, in a, in a lung cancer, you take out the lobe, you know, usually. So you're, even if there's seeding in the tract, it's not metastasizing to distant places. So the real question is, does it really promote distant metastases, um, not just seeding 
along the, the little needle tract, because that's really what would have more prognostic uh, implications. And it seems like from the data that it really doesn't cause metastatic disease. Um, and so that's how we decided to word this, because that's this is really the clinical importance of it. Because if a few cells get seeded, but they're taken out or they're not viable, which a lot of, which there were some reports, there was at least one that seemed to indicate that even if there were cells there, they weren't viable along the track. Anyway, that's how we worded it. So everybody ready to vote? How many people think it's, how many think it's uh, plausible? One, two, three, seven. How many think it's busted? Uh, I think that's, that's a little more. All right, well, then I guess it's busted.